speaker, Ms. Diana cohen Utman, who's the executive director of the Karba Foundation in Washington, D.C. Ms. Altman is a longtime cultural professional. As an exhibition writer at the Smithsonian Institution for 16 years, she helped to develop more than 200 exhibitions for display around the world. For nine years, she served as editor-in-chief of the magazine of the National Association for Museum Exhibition, of which she is a board member. From 2002 until 2008, she was employed by B'nai Biert International as director of the Kluchnik National Jewish Museum, Phil Lacks Archive, Center for Jewish Culture. Ms. Altman has been an associate publisher of Moment Magazine, an international journal of Jewish life, culture, and thought, and currently is executive director of the Karaba Foundation, which celebrates the culture, arts, and heritage of Azerbaijan and the Caucasus. The lecture topic that she's chosen today is Inside the Cabinet of Curiosities. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a very warm welcome for Ms. Diane cohen Altman. Thank you. Well, hello. Um, it occurred to me particularly seeing so many young faces uh, at, the, at the conference, that I probably should give a little bit about my own story, which is not in the um, printed copy, or not in the uh, copy that was circulated of the talk. Um, I think it's needed for context, and also it, I think it um, illustrates a path to practicing cultural diplomacy. As the daughter of a US Foreign Service officer, I grew up in several countries on four continents. I'm also a first-generation American, daughter of a refugee immigrant. We were one of those families that interacted extensively in the host country, and I spent a lot of time observing cultural exchanges. <coughs> when I got to Vassar College, I realized anthropology was a good fit for someone who really wanted to explore the power of culture. After college, I realized museums were as close as I might come to creating opportunities for both great, great cultural partnerships and important dialogues about culture. <coughs> Cold. I worked for the National Gallery of Art, and then I spent 16 years writing and editing cultural exhibitions at the Smithsonian. I became very active in the museum cultural world, professional world, I should say, at a time when museums were starting to consider visitor needs as much as curators' content knowledge. I watched museums implement interactive programs that sought to engage the visitor via, quote, multiple pathways. I participated as museums hungrily took in and applied visitor feedback. <coughs> Still, I felt that the often perceived elitist, quote, opportunity of being in a museum led many content people and visitors to want to conform to a starchy, top-down, mainstream, impress your colleagues, family, friends. <coughs> Even interactive opportunities often felt novel, but just at the periphery of having a true dialogue. In the early 2000s, I became director of the B'nai B'rith National Jewish Museum here in Washington <coughs> at a time when the museum had moved to a venue with almost no gallery space. I realized I had to be creative in designing programs, ex experiences rather than visits, to convey, convey the museum's mission of sharing Jewish culture. <coughs> I started doing programs like Cochin Diary, Jewish Life in Southern India with Indian partners, Sephara, Jewish Culture in Sephardic Spain at Washington National Cathedral, an oral history initiative taking and presenting firsthand Holocaust accounts with multiple audiences. And that's when I realized that cultural diplomacy was it for me. Uh, the process of working with partners like the cathedral and with audiences making discoveries and sharing perspectives, I'm still in touch with several partners and audience members. <coughs> We still talk about the spark that was ignited through these kinds of comings together. So the following presentation is a kind of freeze frame of where I am today, intellectually and practically, with the practice of cultural diplomacy. Literally hundreds of exhibits and public programs later, we're always coming up with new ways to ensure that the experiences don't end with a lovely concert or a compelling exhibition. We call our volunteers cultural ambassadors. I'm grateful to the Institute for the work you do 
and for the opportunity to interact with ideas about the practice of cultural diplomacy. Cultural diplomacy is never a one-way street. <coughs> so inside the cabinet of curiosities. Um, <coughs> let me get some water. Mm. Architecture provides an apt metaphor for envisioning a re-energized US cultural diplomacy home base. Today's frequent open floor plans, widespread redefinition of living room and home offices, suggest a world whose boundaries are different from those of 1950. <coughs> As for today's museum, sophisticated electronics and visitor-friendly displays have replaced many of the do not touch signs and shrine-like cases of yesterday. The sentient US practitioner of cultural diplomacy recognizes that the ways and places in which Americans live, work, and experience the arts have changed since 1950. <coughs> we understand that cultural diplomacy endures, even amid a lack of support for federal cultural diplomacy programs, shrinking finances for private initiatives. We think about the type of initiatives that defined the Cold War years, and we think about where cultural diplomacy lives today. <coughs> Obviously, the, cultural, the virtual world does its work as people all over the world get to know each other from home. Museums in their eclectic modern incarnation engage hearts and minds of Americans and many foreign visitors in issues and topics that clearly transcend national borders. <coughs> so in these two places, homes and museums, cultural diplomacy would seem to be alive and well. But just as the architecture of American lives has changed, so has the look and feel of cultural diplomacy. In some cases, chaos prevails. In others, careful curation drives the process. As difficult as always to measure, cultural awareness and understanding seem to be flourishing. So revisiting the architecture metaphor, one might observe that today's hosts at home and in the museum have found ways to make their guests feel at home. We're just wordlessly gesturing a guest toward a giant flat screen TV in the living room might bewilder a guest from an earlier generation. Asking bold questions about a fellow Xboxer Xbox player might provoke a parent in the next room. Inviting children to climb all over a museum exhibit display might, might horrify a grandparent. <coughs> but such host behaviors are based on, quote, understanding visitor behavior, as a museum director might be quick to point out. In fact, just as before, Many host activities are designed to make the visitor feel part of a familiar environment. And hosts of the home and the museum very often consider this to be the overriding aim. Certainly, a curator might seek to shake up visitor thinking. But more often, the nice welcoming signs and engaging displays do not exactly chase away guests. <coughs> Contemporary museums bring to bear a vast array of experts, architects, educators, curators, audience advocates. The modern home may not be as carefully orchestrated, but certainly reflects the input of planners whose talents may not have been anticipated in 1950. Of course, meanwhile, on the other side of the world, social media friends and museum partners form another part of the scene. The sheer range of cultural discoveries is as varied as the rooms where these events take place. Of course, not all events are planned, not all are curated. US culture is making its way into the Amazon, I don't mean Amazon.com, um, <laughs> onto Moscow city streets, on stage in Nairobi, and in the marketplace in Dhaka. Chance exchanges via social media are changing lives. The kinds of cultural exchanges at play lead one to wonder about the role of wonder in modern US cultural diplomacy. Here's a quote. Um, Porcelain teapots, small metals, intaglio gems, pottery shards, drawn and engraved portraits, masks, carved ivory, pickled monsters, religious utensils, 
and multicultural remains cacophonously chatted among themselves and with the spectator. Like shapeless pigment stains or confusing blots, their manifest incompleteness precluded incorporation into a seamless narrative and controlling taxonomy. Delighting the amateur while defying the classifier, these collections were anamorphic. <coughs> That's from Barbara Maria Stafford, Artful Science, Enlightenment Entertainment, and the Eclipse of Visual Education, 1996. Um, <coughs> Museums may have long abandoned the organizing concept of the Wunderkammer, or cabinet of curiosities. But many a veteran tourist can describe the sheer thrill of wandering into unknown cultural territory. Those seeking to build bonds between any two cultures may do well to give the concept of a wonder room, a curated microcosm of a culture designed as much to amaze as to educate. Um, the juxtaposition of disparate objects for sensory effect not only captures the eye, but also suggests the dynamic nature of culture. Obviously, many countries struggle with the sense of feeling invisible to the United States. Take the Caucasus country of Azerbaijan, for example, despite which despite a vibrant and distinctive culture is off the radar for many Americans. <coughs> Certainly, few Americans can point to Azerbaijan on the map, can cite Azerbaijan's dominant role in the design of oriental carpets, or can recognize the sophisticated strains <coughs> of the Azerbaijani folkloric mugam id idiom. Many ironic twists of history have made it so the word is Azerbaijan does not appear where it should in carpet showrooms, museums, and other bastions of culture. <coughs> Even if the culture of Azerbaijan, or say of Kyrgyzstan, or Mongolia, or Kazakhstan, were to be fully recognized and integrated into US museums, the presentation likely would lack the, in absence of a better word, <coughs> idiosyncratic context needed for the uninitiated to understand the underpinnings of the country's traditions. For sure, a museum of your country hears history in the United States would go a long way in conveying the country's portfolio and contributions to world heritage. <coughs> Such a museum done well would fill the gaps, fill in the gaps in American knowledge and would help erase some of the distortions wrought by the traditional mostly European orientalist approach which is felt to exoticize, romanticize and otherwise change Eastern realities. <coughs> Those who seek to connect Americans and Easterners and the United States and Eastern countries via cultural diplomacy recognize the need for Eastern cultures to have places, real and or virtual, that cannot seem to disappear in a larger narrative. These presentations need to be in a place where onlookers can recognize an entirely, quote, new context. Thank you. <laughs> Um, an entirely new context where subtleties, subtleties can make themselves understood, where others more powerful cannot intrude on or stamp out insider and outsider realities of the culture. <coughs> In the information age, all eyes remain on the web. While virtual museums and exhibits abound, the true blockbusters with lines around the block are the viral videos, and I'm not even sure how I know how to pronounce this, memes, is that how you pronounce it? Okay. The explosion of creativity on the web, along with the trends of globalization in general, have fed increasingly sophisticated and or hungry audiences. The definition of culture and the definition of curator have been stretched in so many directions. <coughs> the word Wunderkammer has made it back into the lexicon of the cultural world. What is YouTube if not a series of Wunderkammern curated by an unprecedented, unprecedented range of cultural practitioners? <coughs> it is perhaps ironic 
that bricks and mortar museums have worked so hard in the past 20 years to become more scientific in their approach to engaging visitors. While taking on social, international, and global issues, they take pains to learn what visitors already know, want to know, need to know, and so forth. And they use techniques designed to target intended audiences. On the other hand, <laughs> YouTube contributors spring from many sources, from the slick marketing world to the slacker universe. Like the Wunderkammer of old, YouTube manifests cur curation but also a kind of infectious chaos. In this Wonder Room environment, being made to feel comfortable is not necessarily the aim. Unlike museums, the actors of YouTube and their like do not classify themselves generally into carefully delineated departments or categories. <coughs> As museums and social media borrow from each other, Cabinets of curiosities are again seen as a viable means of engaging one culture in another. Museums seek to capture some of the immediacy and evident spontaneity of the web world. They recognize, for example, the power of the web to engage via spectacular effects and to avoid being weighed down by necessary contextual uh, presentations, context that the visitor can access elsewhere at the click of a button. On the virtual side, places such as YouTube generate a sense of place even in the absence of four walls. Such social media have found ways, by invoking wonder and even a sense of shock, to compete with the experience of walking into an awe-inspiring museum gallery. Connecting Americans with other cultures takes visionaries who know how to blend the web's manifesto of amazement with the museum's more understated creed of reaching out to each visitor on multiple levels. Artifacts in cases, artifacts in cases, no matter how carefully interpreted and contextualized, most often will fail to capture the individual roller coaster of other countries' histories and the specific cultural meanings of certain touchstones. <coughs> At one time, museums might have thought that the best way of connecting Americans with another country would have been to provide sensory experiences that meet the qualifications of museum interactives. But the intention behind the use of museum interactives must be reassessed in the wake of these new and emerging technologies. Perhaps the purpose should not be to immerse the visitor in cultural experiences. Perhaps the goal of stimulating the visitor into a sense of experience should instead be a goal, to reinforce the visitor's sense of distance from the target culture, to serve as a kind of cultural electric shock that precedes a journey of discovery. The forces that have obscured many cultures from Americans' view are overwhelming from Orientalism, to rich, powerful enemies, to a faraway location, to outsider cultural hegemony. Um, the forces that compete for Americans' attention are legendary. Representing these cultures will require a dramatic entrance onto the cultural stage, entrance into one kind of wonder room or another. Those of us determined to make such cultural connections are considering the Wunderkammer approach of yore, alongside all of the latest museum techniques in our practice of cultural diplomacy. <coughs> in the faces and voices of Americans encountering other cultures for the first time, we have captured not just pleasure, but also surprise. We believe that wonder is uniquely equipped to inspire Americans toward a deep, long-term connection with seemingly, quote, foreign cultures. So if I may, with self-interest in mind, I was hoping we could focus a discussion on what you think of the Cabinet of Curiosity's approach, of the idea of creating cultural programs that build on individual expertise and passions and interesting contexts. Thank you.